strange prehistoric trees such as podocarps and tree ferns make up the temperate rainforest of New Zealand. People have cut down most of the forest hundreds of years ago, but some patches still survive even today. Isolated in the southern Pacific for 80 million years, New Zealand has been cut off from the rest of the world since the time of dinosaurs. As a result, there were no ground living mammals on the islands until people arrived and introduced some animals about 1000 years ago. Birds, however, could reach the place by flying. Kiwis, the flightless birds, are most famous in New Zealand. They feed in the forest by night like hedgehogs, probing and sniffing the soft soil for insects and earthworms with their sensitive bills. The earliest areas to be cleared of forest by Maori people more than 500 years ago are the plains of Canterbury. In the wildest corner of New Zealand, a spectacular heaven for wildlife with its southern beach and podocarp forest shelter. Rare species of parrots, kings and unique New Zealand birds is the paradise of Yardland National Park. Although swept by the winds that howl around Antarctica, the southernmost part of New Zealand has dense temperate rainforests of Stewart Island. Coming towards the industries, Auckland is the chief port and industrial centre and one of the largest city of New Zealand. The temperate forests generally swarm with animals, leaf nibbling insects, wolves and bears. But when the trees lose their leaves in the winter, food is hard to find and life becomes tough. To survive, Animals must make the most of the changing seasons. If you stand under an oak tree on a warm day in early summer and look up, you might think it is raining, but the drops are not of water, but that of honeydew. A sticky sugary fluid ejected by sap-sucking bugs feeding high on the tree. These bugs swarm over the leaves and each bug produces a tiny bead of surplus sugar and water and lets it fall. There are so many bugs on the tree that this dew falls like continuous light rain. A single oak tree can provide food for more than 1000 different types of insects including different sap sucking bugs and caterpillars. They drink the sap, munch the leaves and nibble the buds. And tough jawed beetles gnaw into the bark and timber and drill into acorns to lay their eggs. All these are in turn hunted by the wasps and spiders and these again are snapped up by small birds that nest in the tree. as if a single tree here is a different ecosystem. When the ripe acorns are thrown by the bigger birds like pigeons and crows, they are gathered by squirrels, deer and mice. All these in just one tree. The forest of these can give shelter to countless wild animals. In tropical rainforest, However, there is no winter. Here, animals can feed and breed throughout the year. Unlike tropical rainforest, temperate forests are dead in winters and there is no food for animals. To survive in temperate forest, animals have to change their way of life with the seasons. Hence, they eat lot of different things. 
an American black bear for example may spend days feasting on the berries and apples along with acorns, beech nuts, insects, dead meat and small animals it can catch. Badgers do the same. Squirrels, chipmunks and jays gather nuts at an alarming speed and hide them for hard times to come. Throughout the forest, the fruit and nut season is the time for urgent activity since all animals are aware of the hard times. As winter sets in, the black bear has a simple way of getting through the winter. Having stuffed itself with so much food, it puts on a thick layer of fat around its body. And looks for a snug den in a cave or a hollow of the tree. It sleeps more deeply than normal and all its body process like heartbeats, breathing, digestion, metabolism slow down. In this state, the bear's body uses less energy than when it is active, so the stored fat lasts throughout the long winter and also insulates the body, keeping it warm. Squirrels and badgers sleep through the winter much the same way, although squirrels cannot put on so much fat. They often wake up to raid their store. They can do this by falling into deep sleep called hibernation. Other small animals are not so fortunate unless they escape winter by going somewhere in warm place or can survive in the cold months without food. Animals such as frogs, snakes and butterflies have no option but to hibernate as they rely on the sun to keep them warm. Frogs often hibernate on the bottoms of the forest pools beneath the ice provided the water does not freeze into solid ice. Snakes go underground hiding in the burrows or cavities beneath the tree roots. Sometimes, several garter snakes hibernate in a single den knotted together in an effort to keep out worst of cold. Even then, if the temperature in the den drops below freezing point, the snake freeze too. This is usually fatal, but not always, since it can survive freezing for few hours. Some cold-blooded animals have an antifreeze chemical in their bodies that stops water from turning into ice. Some butterflies spend their winter as pupa, the transition stage when a caterpillar turns into an adult. The pupa stick themselves to freeze and survive extreme temperature and then in spring they turn into winged butterflies. Most forest animals try to live longer than a single summer. If they are able to survive in winter by hibernating or if they go somewhere warmer and when spring arrives and forest bursts into life, they return. This regular movement with the seasons is called migration and most birds do this. Larger animals must, however, endure cold. As they burn energy trying to keep warm, they get hungrier. In European forests, wild boar eats leaves and roots. Birds follow them to snatch up any worms or insects that get earner. Deer and bison kick the snow aside in search of greenery but end up eating twigs and barks. Giant pandas of China have to abandon their bamboo shoots and eat the carcasses of dead animals that have died due to cold and starvation. A giant forest hawks 
swoop and swerve through bare branches to catch small birds in midair. These are in turn hunted by killers like Gasshawk. The owls at night listen to the mice scurrying through leaves, then glide down to catch them. Red foxes and wolves prowl in search of prey or dead meat. Moles go deeper into soil to eat worms and beetles. As the days get longer in spring, the buds and new leaves on the trees open in the sun. The insects that have weathered the winter in buds and bark crevices hatch out and swarms of caterpillars and other grubs emerge to nibble the tender foliage. Many birds that have stayed back in the forest all winter are soon joined by migrants returning to feast on insects and raise their families. The forest is full of life as male birds select desirable nesting sites to start their families. Once the eggs are hatched, the birds face the challenge of feeding the hungry youngsters to support healthy growth. Meanwhile, bigger birds such as hawk and crows feed their young ones with eggs and worms. Luckily, if small birds lose their first family to predators, they normally have enough time to start a second one. As the summer wears on, the leaves on the trees get darker, tougher and less edible. Most insects have turned into moths, flies and wasps. So the feeding frenzy slows down. Many adult insects do not eat at all, but live to mate and lay eggs. Once their job is done, they run out of energy and are picked up by birds or simply fall exhausted to the forest floor. Many birds that flew north from the tropics in spring get ready to fly back again. They eat ravenously till late summer to build up energy, making the most of the insects while they last. Some birds leave as early as August, while some leave as late as October. Eventually, all the summer visitors disappear, and as the leaves start falling from the trees, the animals that are left behind prepare for another winter. Coming towards the land of rugged mountain ranges and rocky islands is the land of Japan. Since most people live near the coasts, the mountains are still heavily forested. Japan's 3,000 islands are formed within the last few thousand years from volcanoes in the ocean floor. Large areas of native temperate forest have been replanted with conifer trees or cleared to make room for industrial development. Today, many Japanese forests are protected from loggers. But people still need wood and demand for timber is met by countries like Malaysia where logging companies are cutting down the wild forests. There are still inaccessible areas in Japan, like parts of Hokkaido mountains, the forested valleys. The cold northern island is like neighboring Siberia, with large areas of taiga forests. The main island, which is thickly populated around the coast, is Honshu Island, the symbol of Japan, Fuji is one of the many volcanoes that have created the rugged Japanese landscape. The wildlife of Japan mainly consists of macaque, the only monkey that lives in deciduous temperate forest. Most monkeys live in the tropics where they can eat fruits all year round. Japanese macaque have discovered other foods like leaves, crops, potatoes, insects and small animals. They find most of their food on the ground 
often digging it out of the snow in the winter. Their extra thick coats help them survive the cold and in the volcanic regions where there are hot springs they keep themselves warm by spending a lot of time in warm pools. One of the largest populated area is that of the temperate forest Payu. And this is due to the fertile soil enriched by the yearly leaf fall which is perfect for agriculture. Around 10,000 years ago, people used axe made of stone blade and wooden handle to chop the mighty trees like an oak. The felled trees were used for fuel and land for farming by clearing the vast areas of the temperate forests. In the beginning, people may have worked on the land and moved on for few years, allowing the forest to grow again. But later, they discovered rich fertile land and stayed at one place for long. Harvesting the plants on the same patch of land again and again made the soil infertile. And the growth of the plant slowed down. Fertility of land ran out fast on farms in tropical rainforests. Dead plants and animals decayed quickly in the hot, wet climate and converted them into nutrients, which the trees absorbed almost immediately. If the trees are cut and transported, they take the nutrients along with them. What is it that makes temperate biome the best farmland of the world? Let us now understand the reason for this. In temperate forest, thick layer of dumped leaves in autumn decay slowly due to cold winter. It starts only in spring and summer. Fungi, bacteria, tiny creatures and microorganisms break leaves in smaller particles and earthworms plough through the earth and churn it up creating a fertile layer of mineral grains and slowly rotting leaf fragments. The nutrients in the soil are slowly absorbed by the plants and this allows enriching soil for simple farming indefinitely, making the biome of the temperate forest the best farmland of the world. Let us now discover the first farmers and how farming was done by the then settlers in the temperate forest. The first people to discover the rich soils of the temperate forest were the Stone Age farmers who moved to Europe from the Eastern Mediterranean about 9,000 years ago. Initially, these newcomers kept their farming skills to themselves while the original inhabitants stuck to hunting, fishing. Slowly, these people became farmers and by 6,000 years ago, there were farmlands all over Europe. Studies of ancient layers of soil have shown large amounts of tree pollen, proving that ancient farmers valued the forest as a source of food and timber. They discovered that if they left stumps of trees behind, each stump would sprout five or more shoots, which would be enough for firewood, house building and even road building. People in the past felled just few trees and allowed their stumps to sprout and harvested this wood as crop. This method was called coppicing and it was very important to Europeans for thousands of years. Coppicing allowed Europeans to obtain the timber they needed without destroying the forest. But in the temperate forests of China, it was different. Much of the soil in China is very fertile type, called loess, which is extremely fine-grained and it can be blown off by wind. Many central plains of China have these drifts. Early Chinese farmers were happy to turn land into fields, but this process of land erosion is now a big problem in China. 
as without tree roots to hold it together, the loess could dry out and blow away or be swept away by floods which destroyed nearly all native plants and animals. Today, rare Chinese animals like giant panda live only in the patches of mountain forests that are too steep and rugged to be turned into farmland. These pandas face acute food shortage and starvation and this leads to loss of animals. There are only about 2,000 giant pandas left on this planet and soon they will be extinct. Farthest to the southeast of China is New Zealand which was once covered with unspoiled temperate rainforest. The first settlers arrived about 1,000 years ago, sailing from islands in the Pacific. Their descendants are called the Maoris. They cleared the forest as soon as they arrived, mainly by burning. By the time British Captain James Cook came to explore, half the forest was gone. Maoris do not seem to have used much land for farming and they probably set fire to the forest to smoke out giant flightless birds called moas. This technique worked so well that much of the forest disappeared and the moas became extinct. Coming towards Northern America, the Native American tribes of the temperate forests had far less destructive way of life. The economy of the forest people like the Iroquois and Algonquian tribes was based on cultivation of corn, beans, hunting and fishing. When English settled in Massachusetts in 1620, the eastern forests were still intact. The English started clearing the land for farms and within 200 years, most of it was farmland. In Europe, people cleared vast areas of forests for farms, but they stopped this suddenly due to spread of an epidemic called Black Death which wiped out one-third of European population. By the time the population recovered, farming became more efficient and there was enough farmland to feed everyone. The surviving woodlands became too valuable to be destroyed. New industries like construction, shipbuilding, and iron smelting were introduced. But as the technology moved on, coal was replaced by charcoal as main fire fuel and hardwoods were no longer used for shipbuilding and houses. The ancient woodlands lost their value and only about 10% of the original temperate forests survived. The temperate forests were replaced by human landscapes and very little of the world's surviving forest remained truly wild. With growing population and cities, people now turn to wilderness for relaxation and forests have now become a part of leisure industry. Weekenders can wander into the forests and can get some idea as to how it would have been like 10,000 years ago before the invention of axe. Moving to the southern eastern temperate rainforest, we find eucalyptus tree forests in Australia extending to Tasmania. The Australian temperate rainforests are classified as World Heritage Site due to their unique wildlife. These forests provide home to the world's tallest flowering plants like mountain ash which is 100 meters tall, that is 330 feet. Australians often call eucalyptus trees as gum trees or stingy bark trees. These trees are known for their fragrant oil in their leaves. This oil is used as medicine for cough and colds. Eucalyptus leaves are poisonous to the most animals. But a few animals have a digestive system which can deal with the poisons. 
the most famous is the koala. It has powerful jaws that grind the leaves to find pulp and the bacteria living in its digestive system convert the tough leaf fiber into sugar. The system works well except for their babies who are born without bacteria. The mother squirts half digested bacteria filled leaf and this is eaten by the babies thus creating their own bacteria system. The chain of mountains which runs along the east coast of Australia is the Great Dividing Range. It brings rain from the Pacific Ocean, Australia's cultural centre and the largest city with a population of almost 4 billion is the city of Sydney. The scenic beauty of Tasmania wilderness is a group of four national parks and is a rare example of the Southern Hemisphere temperate wilderness. It is one of the world's heritage areas. The temperate forests are the most densely populated part of the world. If they are to survive, it has to be conserved with great care. The cork, which is used to keep wine inside the bottle, is made from thick bark of the cork oak tree which grows in the western regions of the Mediterranean. Every 10 years, farmers strip the bark of the cork oak tree which later grows and forms a new layer. In Spain and Portugal, cork oak trees are harvested in this way for centuries. If big wine makers abandon the real cork for plastic, the trees will be cut and the land then would be used for more profitable crops. And the most ancient cork oak forest will vanish forever. Hence, if there is market for the cork, the forest will survive. The forest is the means of survival for some people. Very little forest has remained truly wild. Most of it has been managed to produce regular crops or coppiced woods. To certain people, forests are living factories that provide home to wild plants and animals. And if these plants are not properly used, the owners of these forests would keep destroying these woodlands for more profitable purposes. Another threat to the temperate forests comes from global warming. When our power plants and cars use fossil fuels like coal and petrol, they release carbon dioxide gas in the atmosphere. This gas causes greenhouse effect which stops heat from escaping into space, causing the planet to warm up. Global warming causes disruption in the climates of the world. The melting of the North Arctic ice could disrupt the ocean currents that carry warm water to Northern Europe and Western Europe could get colder, as cold as Siberia. The forests will then have to adopt these changes. 